The following program is brought to you by coronavirus and the newest in the beta coronavirus line, COVID-19. Coronavirus, bringing human misery for 8,000 years. And by the state of Wisconsin's prohibition on gatherings of more than 10 people. Wisconsin, forward. And by the faculty and staff of Lawrence University. Welcome to Historic Preservation, Lecture 7 on Determining Significance. This is all part of the Section 106 process that we'll be going through this week and actually for the rest of the course. So, we're going to talk about how under the Section 106 process someone determines whether significant historical properties are present. And the first thing to do under Section 106 is to de determine if there's a federal project going on at all. And those projects are typically called undertakings. Here I just wrote down project. Those federal undertakings are defined by having federal involvement, which makes some sense. But as we've talked about before, the federal government has pretty long reaching arms. And a federal undertaking includes anything that has any involvement by the federal government. And so certainly things that are funded by the federal government, um, activities that the federal government is doing on military bases or for airports or uh, highways or things like that, certainly are federal projects, federal undertakings. But if you need a permit from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, for example, because you're building in a wetlands, that becomes a federal undertaking because you need a permit from a federal organization. If you're an organization that gets federal funding of any kind, like Lawrence University, and you want to build something, that is a federal undertaking also. A local county building a, a, a new city hall or a county courthouse, federal undertaking. They get federal money. So federal projects encompass lots of things that you wouldn't necessarily think they do. And in fact, today, most projects that are not for private individuals or, you know, small private companies are going to fall under the federal project uh, mandate. Even some houses, if they're building it, for example, in wetlands, are going to be part of the federal project. So, does a federal project exist, federal undertaking, with the potential to affect historic properties? If you're building in a wetland, you probably don't have historic properties. But, if you're building, for example, in the mid middle of Appleton, there might be some historic properties that could be affected. So, under Section 106, the first thing that you do is, is there a federal undertaking? Let's say there is. Lawrence University is going to build something. Is there the potential to affect historic properties? We're in the City Park Historic District. Yeah. We make that determination and we move on to Part 2. And this is the key piece under Section 106 for determining significance. Are there historic or culturally significant properties? And that question is really, are there properties eligible for the National Register? And remember that this is about eligibility. Not that they're listed already, but whether they are eligible to be listed or potentially eligible to be listed. Okay. Let's think about a property here on campus. Let's say that on the quad, they want to tear down all the buildings and construct a new dorm. Are there any, so it's a federal undertaking, are there any culturally significant properties or historic properties on the quad that could be uh, damaged, affected by that? Well, there's uh, the Center for Religious Life which was Sabin House. Uh, that's a, a very beautiful late Victorian home. 
Is that eligible? Well, we already talked about that, right? That, in fact, it's not because it's been moved. What about the fraternities or the small houses? Small houses across the street aren't going to be affected. Those are National Register eligible. The fraternities, are those National Register eligible? Well, that's an interesting question. And to do that, we would have to do research. They're more than 50 years old. They were built in the late 40s. Are they a significant part of campus? Well, there would be need to be some discussion of that. Are they architecturally significant? Are there significant historic events that happen there? All of those categories that go into National Register eligibility need to be taken into account. And so we're going to, at this point, say, yeah, those may be eligible for the National Register, and so we need to do some more. Now, I have it here culturally significant because uh, a major part of Section 106 was revised in the late 1980s and the early 1900s, and this is discussed in one of your books, in part because of NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and because of the creation and development of TIPO offices, Tribal Historic Preservation Offices. And there are culturally significant landscapes and properties for Native American tribes that may not be seen as or considered uh, significant under the National Register in terms of being a historic building or having an important historic event. So that's put in there largely so that the tribes will be consulted to make sure that, for example, a sacred landscape of some kind is not being destroyed. That's determination part two. There are two pieces that we typically do, and let me actually go back, we'll begin, that we do to start out this process. One of those is basic archival research. We go in and we make some determinations. Is this property older than 50 years old? Has it, is it in its original location or setting? Is it a religious structure? Does it have any of those potential exemptions that we talked about uh, for being on the National Register? Then we start looking for things to ask, is this the work of a master? Is this a uh, historic property that captures an era in terms of its architecture? Is it a great representation of that? Did, it, did an important person, uh, is, are they involved with this? Is a historic event deeply involved with this? We can do a lot of that through archival research, historic research, research on architecture of the area, finding out who the builder was, who the masons were, or the architect, the masons, all of those kinds of people, the, the events that happened there, um, whether there were important people involved, and, and determine through that whether there is any properties that would be National Register eligible. The other thing that we might do is field research. We might go out to those buildings and actively look at them, survey them. We might even, if we're doing archaeology, do archaeological research to determine whether there are any sites there. In archaeological research, we call it CRM, Cultural Resource Management. We call that phase one. It's just doing survey, seeing if there's anything there. And we might do some phase two excavations, which are test excavations. So these are things that we might do to see if there are eligible properties. But one of the things we also need to do is consultation. And that kind of gets back to the Tribal Historic Preservation Officers and others. Consultation definition here seeks information from consulting parties. That's one of the, these definitions that has the word in the definition, but consulting parties are basically stakeholders, anyone who has any interest in this property <coughs> or the project, and other individuals and organizations likely to have knowledge or concerns with historic properties in the area. So tribes are one of them, but if you look at this more broadly, organizations, if we're going to build on the quad, Lawrence University should be consulted. Are there important things for Lawrence that have happened there? 
are there concerns that might be going on if those buildings were torn down from area residents? Concerns with historic properties. The Historic Preservation Commission would need to be consulted. The local historical society. The um, area homeowners. Uh, the people, you know, that live in the neighborhood. Students that attend Lawrence. All of those people need to be consulted. One of your textbooks makes a big deal about consultation and what it means. And, and that author is really correct. If we go back and we think about archival and field research, those are impersonal. And one of the things that we need to think about in terms of determining significance is that significance is not necessarily impersonal. It can be, and often is, very personal. Something embodies the community. Something holds great significance to a cultural group. And that isn't always obvious out of the archival or field research. It becomes obvious when you consult with those people. And you realize that these buildings, this landscape, has great meaning to them, great significance to them. And that's a valid reason for considering it to be on the National Register, because it, that that may make it eligible. The, the value that it has to a particular community may make it eligible. We've talked about Penn Station and how that, for New Yorkers, embodied something about New York. And when it was torn down, there was a great outcry about it. Well, was that building more than 50 years old at the time? Yeah. Did it embody great architecture? Uh, yeah, it was pretty interesting and important, but you know, as a train station, one could argue uh, maybe not, but it had great meaning to the community, and and so that's really what consultation is all about. In addition to that, the people who have knowledge about and concerns with historic properties are often the most knowledgeable people in the community. So you go back to the archives and field research, you might not find nearly as much as the people who have knowledge, who have the oral history, the stories about the buildings and the landscape, the, um, the, the traditions that have been passed down, and, and that meaning for the community. So this consultation is a really key part of determination. Okay, let's take a small break and we will be right back. Please give your attention to this important public safety announcement. Is Dr. Budelheimer here? I am in the hospital because I am very sick. I did not go to the hospital until I could not breathe, and I thought I would die. But then I called my doctor, and he said, get there directly. So I did, and now I am feeling much better. If you have to go to the hospital, you'll know because you will be feeling very bad. Otherwise, you can shelter in place or quarantine. Okay? I'll feel the same. Shoes. Bye bye. Okay, and we are back. We've just talked about determining under Section 106 if there are significant properties, and significance again means are there properties that are eligible to be listed on the National Register? And once we've done that, say we have done that. The determination of significance make, takes one step further, and that is this. Are there the potential for adverse effects? So you're doing a federal undertaking. Let's say you're building a new dormitory on the quad. You've gone out. You've done your research. You've talked to constituents. And you say, yeah. The, the quad buildings maybe are National Register eligible for a variety of reasons. The question is, will there be adverse effects? Well, let's say that Lawrence is building a new dormitory just at the far end of the quad and is going to leave the other buildings there. Will there be adverse effects? They're not going to be torn down. 
So you might say, no, there's no adverse effects, but there could be other ones because that physical adverse effect is not the only one that could be there. The other one could be the feel or atmosphere or context. Really, what we're talking about is anything that could affect National Register eligibility. So let's talk a little bit more about adverse effects. By definition under the law, adverse effects are ones that may alter directly or indirectly, directly or indirectly, any of the characteristics of a historic property that qualify the property for inclusion in the National Register. So, directly or indirectly. Remember that there are some key elements that exclude properties from being listed. And among those are that atmosphere, feel, the context. If you put a 20-story steel glass structure at the end of the quad, does that change the feel, the atmosphere, the context of the Lawrence campus? Yes. That might be considered an adverse effect. We can think of lots of other cases. If we're going to put a highway next to a battlefield, we know that the battlefield is on the National Register already. We want to build a highway. We go back through the determination process. We already know that it's National Register because it's there. Now we have to start talking about adverse effects. Will the adverse effects impact the physical nature of the battlefield? Well, let's say it's going along the side. So it's not impacting the actual battlefield. Would that change the feel, atmosphere, or context? Well, having a highway running right by a Civil War battlefield, yeah, it's going to change the feel, the atmosphere, and the context. No longer can you go into that battlefield and get a sense of what it was like in 1864 or 63. Now you've got a highway running right next to it. So that would be considered an adverse effect. Again, directly, because this thing is going to require you to tear down something. This road is going to go right through the battlefield. But that's not the only adverse effect that you can have. Indirect are just as important. Is it going to change the feel, the atmosphere of that site? And a lot of things, adverse effects are considered because of that indirect uh, adverse effect. OK. We have determined that there is a significant property. We have determined that there are going to be adverse effects. Now what we need to do is come to some kind of an agreement between the State Historic Preservation Officer or the Advisory Council and whatever the federal agency is that's doing the undertaking. Typically, that may, takes the form of a memorandum of, un, un, of agreement, a memorandum of agreement, or an MOA, that specifies some formal mitigation. It's called mitigation. That mitigation can include lots of different things. It can include not doing the project. It can include changing the project so that the adverse effects are not there. It can include an alteration of what's going on so that, for example, in the case of the battlefield, we might route the road another mile away so that it doesn't take away the atmosphere. In the case of, we, we talked about building a 20-story steel structure at the end of the quad. Well, we might alter that so that, in fact, what we do is to build a lower building and spread it out more or something that has the same character as the rest of the Lawrence buildings. That's what alteration is. Um, it's just, it's changing the, the, the project so that the project still goes on and accomplishes what needs to be done, but that the historic properties are not impacted either physically 
or in terms of their context. An undertaking can also be canceled. That's rare, but it does happen. Typically, there are alterations that can be identified. Um, and often that just means moving something so that you're not impacting that site. Um, there are some other kinds of alterations. For example, an archaeological site. Uh, let's say that on the Lawrence campus, um, someone wa wants to put in a parking lot on one of the uh, empty lots. And um, preliminary studies suggest that there is an important archaeological site there that no one ever knew. Well, in fact, putting a parking lot on top of that might not require much mitigation. Depending on how that's built, you might need to have an archaeologist there when drainage pipes are dug out to the street to watch and see if any archaeological materials are coming up and to record those that do come up. But actually sealing an archaeological site with concrete is not a bad thing. It protects it. So that actually might not really need much mitigation, building a parking lot on top of an archaeological site, other than to make sure that wherever the digging is going, you have somebody watching that. So projects are not typically canceled, they're altered. And that process is called mitigation, creating of a memorandum of understanding. There are a lot of different ways to mitigate, and we're not going to go through all of those, but we will talk about some of those in the next lecture and in lectures in the future. What happens if you can't get an agreement? Well, then the undertaking proceeds without an agreement and just goes ahead. Usually no one wants that to happen. And it's extremely unusual for that to happen. But that does happen. There are times when an undertaking stops, or, or an undertaking, sorry, the, the uh, process of Section 106 stops. No agreement can be made. The project just goes ahead without any alteration. Uh, that's a failure of Section 106, and so that's why it's very rare. The, section 106 is really based on the idea that parties involved can come together in an agreement to create some kind of mitigation based on alteration of the undertaking so that the project can go forward. Okay, we'll see you next time. Oh, hello. I'm outside today reading in my smaller garden. Uh, I'm looking in your historic preservation book. And there's an interesting quote here I'd like to read. It says this, changes over time, sorry, it's on page 202 near the top. It says this, changes over time are evidence of the history and development of a building structure or site and its environment. These changes may have acquired significance in their own right, and this significance should be recognized and respected. It's an interesting idea, isn't it? We've talked about it before, about how a building evolves and it's a living thing. But think about this, now you have changes in a building that may have themselves taken on significance. What's the role of that in historic preservation and in the Section 106 process? How does one mitigate or how does one follow Secretary's standards when one is faced with a building that is perhaps key for a particular historic period of time but then has changed so that at a later period of time it has an important architectural feature added or an important feature taken away? and something new put in place? Those are difficult questions and ones that I would like you to think about. We'll see you later.